It's a real honor and a privilege for me to ask Mona to talk to you about it. Thank you. <coughs> So on the 15th of this year, January, I got back to my desk after the holiday and there was an email from Willem. And I'll read you the email very shortly because it's like he, he's <laughs> straight to the point. Dear Mornay, I hope you had a good break and looking forward to the new year. I host the ACL study group meeting in Cape Town from the 26th of January. Can I ask you to give the Fagan lecture? Two guys that the group wanted, Francois Pinard and Mornay Duplessis. Francois is in London, I hope you can make it. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you all for being in our country, and uh, we hope that you have a fruitful time at this study group meeting. Um, actually, I'm quite sorry Francois Pinard wasn't the one to. <laughs> not, not that I wanted to miss it, but. Uh, that you could meet a really outstanding young South African, a young South African of the new South Africa. And as much as I like to be part of it, and I do really truly feel part of it, I was born in a different era, I come through two stages of this country. He is truly a son of the new South Africa, and it's, I'm sorry that you didn't get to, uh, to meet him. Francois Pena, of course, the captain of the 95 Rugby World Cup team. I was the manager, along with a very inspirational man, Kitch Christie, who was the coach. Uh, the three of us shared the sort of leadership of that um, epic team talk. And of course, it was calling for a Churchillian type. We'll fight them on the beaches <laughs> speech. But frankly and strangely, we, we both felt compelled to be very quiet and to a very quiet change room expecting this bashing of the walls down all we said to them was that we were proud of them they had achieved the unthinkable in reaching the final almost and what is more that they had changed people's lives in this country they had made a difference to people's lives and how many of us in the world can actually say that that we change people's lives. And these 25 young guys, we said to them, you have made a difference. I fast forward to last year, and I was at a function where Francois Pena, the captain, was being heralded for his achievement in setting up a charity that looks to the educational needs of disadvantaged youngsters, and they've helped hundreds of youngsters. And the work and the name of that charity was inspired by that team talk. It's called the Mad Charity, Make a Difference. So that's just a small side story and to illustrate to you Francois Pinot's success and I'm sure that he would have loved to be with you today, but as Philip mentioned, he's in London and you have me. <laughs> You're not gonna let me forget. <laughs> At the end of last year, of course, also brought about the sadly inevitable passing of President Mandela. Um, it would pay Madiba somewhat disservice, I think, to overemphasize the importance and significance of the 1995 World Cup and his part in that story. Because it would diminish the extraordinary life and worldwide reach of this man. However, it did happen. It was a miracle that happened, and I was there to, to be privileged to touch the miracle. And I'm going to share some of the emotions and thoughts with you with a short video that does it much better than I will, and then tell you a few personal stories. Uh, just before we start the video, and I hope we're right at the, right at the back there, um, Francois and I got to go to Madiba's funeral the stadium funeral at the FNB Stadium and um, it was it was a difficult experience to be honest because one didn't know how to feel um, you were going to a stadium with somewhat a bit of excitement yes you were celebrating his life but there was a feeling that I couldn't put my finger on and a little while later at his funeral in Kunu, 
his lifelong friend Ahmed Katrada summed it up exactly what I felt and I think many of us felt in this country. And he said that there was now a void in their lives because the man we could all turn to under any circumstance in this country had, had departed. And there was this incredible void. Who would we turn to now was the question. And that's the feeling we had at that stadium. Unfortunately, the eight hours we sat there, I think the speeches were, were over-politicized. The speeches were long. Um, President Obama was incredible. I would say that without him there that day, Madiba would have been disappointed. And his three grandchildren. His three grandchildren, in one minute each, actually said more than five hours of speeches took that day. They spoke about their granddad and his love for them. And that, was, that, that was a simple message, his love for this country. I realized that day, and I really am sincere about this whenever I do speak at functions, and you can be sure I live up to that today, that it does take a long time to write a short speech. It was Anton Chekhov, the famous Russian playwright, said, brevity is a sister of talent. So I am not going to go on with long speeches, but just feel the emotion of that time in our country that we could have taken the wrong crossroads. You could not possibly have been sitting here today. Your conference could have been somewhere else in the world, if not for the direction given in those times by Madiba. And this was part of that history. The events that are the most precious for me in my life, I would say that certainly being present at the birth of my three, my three children, and then I would add being present at the birth of a, of a nation. And obviously it has huge magnitude. There was a moment they showed at Ellis Park where the crowd was chanting Nelson, Nelson, Nelson. And I just finished with a team in the change room. They'd gone out to sing, sing the national anthems. I, you know, the manager's job is to lock the change room. That's your, one of your important jobs. And I came out in the tunnel and this harsh winter sunlight, just listening to this chanting, and I couldn't believe it. It was 60,000, 5,000 predominantly white South Africans chanting, Nelson, Nelson, Nelson. And at that moment, I knew that this country had a great chance, that this, this was the birth of a, of, a, of a country. In the year 2000, the Press Club of South Africa have a engagement every year where they choose the press maker of the or the news maker of the year and in the year 2000 they had their 10 year celebration of these news makers and of course Madiba was of the 10 years he was seven years he was the news maker of the year but in 1995 the rugby world cup team was the news maker of the year so we were invited to the to the function it was in the middle of the rugby season so all the rugby players couldn't be there I present, represented the rugby team and I was in a table of 500 guests right at the back and President Mandela came to receive the award for being the newsmaker of the decade and he was already then cutting down on his uh, commitments, made his thank you speech and was being ushered out by the bodyguards when suddenly this whole party sort of turned through the tables and sort of came to where our table was. I was looking around him, and he'd probably seen me because of my height standing up and he wanted to come and greet and his words to me were, when he saw me, he said, ah, Mone, do you remember me? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, much like when you, when you meet the Queen or royalty, you, you don't speak until spoken to, but I, I just didn't know what to say to him. I was completely speechless and sort of just smiled and, and accepted that warm greeting from him and he just <coughs> epitomized for me the qualities of people that I admire the most and of course he is amongst them right at the top and that is extreme humility, um, friendship and of course the sense of humor and his humility for this nation um, has been an extraordinary, extraordinary part of our history. 
I just wondered that you talked about everyone being in the best shape of all the other teams. And what was the uniqueness of the training program that you were going through with them, maybe compared to the other teams that you played in that era? No, that, that's very interesting. Unlike today, where information is so freely available, you, you know, every team knows almost exactly what the other teams are doing now with the information. But I remember the, uh, the company, can I mention the company IBM, uh, the local branch, they wanted to assist our planning process for the World Cup and they uh, donated a laptop to the team. And I was the only man with a laptop in rugby in 1995. Now, I didn't know how to use it, but I had, the, <laughs> I, I had a laptop. Now, you think where we've got to. We've got to where we are today. So, you know, you didn't know what the other, you had rumors, they're training this way, they're training that way. But Kurt Christie was from the old school. Willem and I come from a scientific um, environment, looking at new methods. Um, certainly, the, the issue of overtraining is a big problem in sport today. But Kitsch just felt that mentally, if he could take the team down to their lowest physical level, long before the World Cup, obviously, in the six months preceding that, he would build up slowly this, this belief in themselves that they could withstand anything. And it's not so foreign. It's not, there might have been overtraining, certainly, at some times I would plead with him, I'd say, Kitsch, this is too much. This is too much. We used to go every Monday and Tuesday to meet in Johannesburg for six months and the players couldn't walk after those two. And they had other games to fulfill as well. So it was really the old <coughs> adage of, of face the worst you can possibly face, that anything else is better. You know, that's probably what he put them through. And they were physically incredible. I mean, these young guys. They, uh, they, one of the uh, things about Invictus, the movie, is that they didn't use the players. They should have actually used the players, even though it was 10 years after they were playing. Our players all felt that the guys in Invictus were not quite in the shape that they were. Uh, <laughs> the, act, the actors. Matt, Matt Damon, in exception, he was a great guy. We met him here, a uh, wonderful guy. He and Clint Eastwood more, they really bought into this. They were so involved spiritually and emotionally in the story. It was just amazing. It was the essence of the film, was the change that came about in the team itself. Uh, when the team was selected, the boys were very proud to be a Springbok. As the, as the movie or this video says, every boy in this country wants to be a Springbok. And that's an achievement, but we were very cognizant of, of the time of the fact that we were actually allowed to play that World Cup because of the reconciliation and forgiveness of Mandela and the whole ANC. It could have been a different path for us. So we were, we as leaders in the team were very cognizant of our role, that this was just not a rugby tournament. And from day one, when the team was actually announced on TV, we had a banner in front of the team, one team, one country. That's when it started. And slowly we had to infiltrate the thoughts of those that weren't convinced yet of what it really meant. And that you couldn't just go into the township and throw a few balls around, hand out a few t-shirts. You had to believe in that, what, that, that activity. I was just curious, in 2014, with adolescence in South Africa now, are the children in rugby integrated? Are they playing together? Are they separate teams? What has happened now, the years later? Yeah, you, you, it's an amazing question that we actually have the answer to. Our, the Sports Science Institute was, um, was um, incorporated, a commission to do a major research paper on transformation in rugby and, and what's happening and how many players have come through from the black ranks. Unfortunately, we have these anomalies where we speak of the black ranks and the colored ranks, and I'm, I'm afraid to even tell you that, but that's the reality of it. And in essence, um, the feeling of rugby that it's not, it hasn't fulfilled its promise. It's good, but it certainly is not where we would like it to be in terms of the boys getting through to the representative teams. There's a huge amount of rugby played at a school level, 
um, it's just the step up into the professional ranks that we have to work hard at. And so much so that rugby has decided that they will have a system of, of um, what do you call it? I don't want to, yeah, I don't want to call it the quota system, but that your team will have to, we will have to go back to insisting that players of color and disadvantaged players get a, a, a equal or better opportunity. So rugby is serious about it. Rugby is, I mean, I'm a rugby man and rugby is a well-run sport. Generally, all sports has politics. Men's politics, we know. Your organization has politics. Organizations have politics. There was a black player on the team and I was wondering uh, where he got his training and experience from. Chester, Chester Williams from the Cape. Um, the Cape um, coloured community is a very prolific rugby community. They, they love the game, they love the game. It's played on farms, it's played in schools, it's played in... in and he, Chester, would have been at a normal school, probably um, where rugby was played, uh, not at the absolute highest level, would have been spotted and then take it into one of the academies. The very few academies that were in those days uh, were, were prevalent. But you, you again put your finger on a very important issue. Sport at school is a big concern for us in this country because sport has become very difficult to offer the students. The teachers are busy with teaching. There's so many other pressures. So a lot of the schools, especially in the disadvantaged areas, <coughs> are not playing sport. And it is a huge problem for the sporting future and health of our country. And the ministry is dealing with it, but you know, we, we struggle to get school books to the kids, you know, let alone sports after, after school. So it is one of the big challenges. And that links to your colleague's previous question. That's why the conveyor belt is probably not. The boys that get look found early, they go to schools like Gray and bishops and Rondebosch and Polrus, they get selected, but that's not a long-term answer. You, you're sending them out of their environments, they actually have to start coming out of the schools where their communities are. A special thank you from the ACL study group for this magnificent lecture. You presented to us as a sportsman, as a patriot, as a philosopher, as a historian, and it's something we can all identify with. You really touched our heart and soul. I thank you for that. And thank you for introducing us to Nelson Mandela in a way we may not have appreciated in the past and is meaningful to all of us who have participated in sports for our countries. Thank you.